This video is brought to you by the creators of Death of a Game. No, seriously. And in this episode, we're covering another Turtle Rock Studios game, Back for Blood, said to be a spiritual successor to Left 4 Dead 2. From the creators of Left 4 Dead, well, sort of, more like the creators of Evolve, another title we covered in the series, Back for Blood was a cooperative zombie narrative action game that launched back in October of 2021. Although Back for Blood would garner some success thanks in large part to its feature on Xbox Game Pass, within just over a year, support would be reportedly cancelled for the game. I personally played the game pre and post launch extensively and have some thoughts about the title, but the series is really about navigating the timeline of a game from pre to post production and finding the largest clues and bits of evidence that lead to uncovering what the largest reasons for the game's failures are. Stay tuned until the end of the episode for every detective's favorite final deduction where we put it all together. Following the flight and then fall of their previous multiplayer shooter, Evolve, Turtle Rock Studios, which used to be a part of Valve and then became independent again before Tencent acquiring them in 2021, would express interest in a new title, this time relying more heavily on the roots of the company to an extent, aka zombies and aka action. Total Rock Studios would announce what many were calling a spiritual successor to the iconic Left 4 Dead series by Valve and Turtle Rock Studios, dubbed Back for Blood, March 14th, 2019. If you remember in my Evolve video, which should be a hint to go watch that one if you haven't, detectives, then you remember that Turtle Rock Studios, or whoever owns it now, is quite fond of advertising their Left 4 Dead roots, including on future projects as a marketing tool. Now there isn't anything inherently wrong with doing this except that on Back for Blood, for instance, it contains only 6 of the over 200 plus developers involved in Left 4 Dead 2. In Crobcat's video concerning Back for Blood, they highlighted this discrepancy in great detail. Not only does it come across as disingenuous out of the gate, again, since Turtle Rock Studios already did it with Evolve, it feels like they're setting an insanely high standard and expectation on their upcoming new game. It's like if someone made a new vacuum but had a few creators of Dyson or something working on it and advertised that straight out of the gate. Well, you better be putting Dyson out of business because, with all likeliness, you're probably getting buried by a corporation. The point is, is that heavy expectations can kill you before you even get past the starting line. Still, TRS could deliver and fans like myself were excited enough as a new Left 4 Dead-like shooter hadn't come out in some time. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a plethora of zombie games in circulation, just that cinematic narrative-based cooperative shooter zombie games were kind of Left 4 Dead's whole realm. Back for Blood's closed alpha would happen December 17th, 2020, and it featured one level from the campaign and some details concerning the game itself. For starters, you would now play as a cleaner, which as TRS would state, would be less scared and impressional versions of the survivors from Left 4 Dead. Cleaners were effectively professionals. There was also a new card system which basically served as mutations or upgrades for players. Back for Blood was supposed to launch the summer of 2021, but would be delayed until October 12th, 2021. Back for Blood would become playable to everyone during their open beta summer 2021, priming everyone for their new targeted fall launch. This is the first time I played the game and at quite a length. I easily put 40 hours into Back for Blood during this time, as I was a huge fan of Left 4 Dead, but more specifically, the PvP in Left 4 Dead. The amount of hours I spent dangling survivors off of buildings as a smoker are just too many to count. When I came to Back for Blood, I was expecting some evolution of that model, and some more of that fun, but was like many other players let down tremendously when I realized that the PvP experience in b for b is all about a swarm mode, where teams take turns competing for the best time. If that sounds boring, well, it is, especially when compared to the classic Left 4 Dead experience where you progress through the story while also PvPing. But the mode itself wasn't the only reason that PvP in Back for Blood was turning out to be boring in the open beta already, which wasn't a good sign. It would quickly become repetitive due to the locations being limited, but even the Ridden themselves as they were dubbed in this game, the special hero zombies were all rather poorly and boringly designed. While in Left 4 Dead Infected brought with them the special tools that made them both useful and fun to play, many of the ones in Back 4 Blood just felt like boring reskins of another variant. And not a good reskin either. I feel like quality over quantity here would have helped a lot more, and actually evolving some identity for your monsters would have helped as well. Another element of Back 4 Blood that was hitting with mixed results was the new card system that set the game apart from Left 4 Dead. 
but it was one of those why set yourself apart sort of things. I get having upgrades in the game, but the card system felt like a needless and pointless RNG that doesn't even thematically fit the game. Sure, some of the upgrades could be useful and even help and benefit your team, which made playing as a loner or support player a reality, but the execution just felt needlessly convoluted. If they wanted you to upgrade skills, doing the classic MOBA level as you go approach seemed to be the best one in my opinion. The card system being a bit of a hit and miss wasn't too bad of a loss for Back for Blood though. The most worrying thing that I noticed during the open beta was actually the content and the shelf life of the game itself. I had concerns that the game's content would last players past a few months of casual play, but TRS possibly anticipating this issue as they were fully aware that they were launching a game as a service, which means that people were probably gonna hate it at launch, would release their game on Xbox Game Pass, making it playable to millions of players without having to buy the full price game. This would not only open up Back for Blood to a massive Xbox audience and online PC audience, but give them a healthy player base to last the next coming months, which would be crucial for the launch of the game and also potentially give them the most time to release more DLC content that they could package together for a combined edition at a later date. Much like Evolve and all the other games as a service have featured. Back for Blood would, as expected, launch October 12th, 2021. As lead designer Chris Astin of Left 4 Dead fame would state, Back for Blood encapsulates all of the hard work by the entire Turtle Rock Studios team to deliver a brand new best-in-class zombie shooter. Back for Blood was a first-person cooperative zombie shooter that played over the course of six different acts, or four at launch. Each act contains different missions and story content throughout it, and you can find special weapons and unlocks hidden throughout the maps. Not that much different than Left 4 Dead in a sense. Players must choose one of the eight unique cleaners and work together in groups of four, or play online solo with bots. Oh, that's right. Did I mention that you can't play the game offline? Not only does Back for Blood have de novo boys, it actually can't be played offline with bots. And while some of you might be saying, but it's a cooperative game, why would you play with bots? Well, contrary to popular belief, this was actually a very common way that people played Left 4 Dead. Back for Blood not having it would greatly harm the player base, just like Halo not having it harmed their player base. IGN, who scored the title an 8 out of 10, would state that between its stellar card augmentations, excellent campaign, and jovial tone that creeps into every facet of its design, Back for Blood puts some exciting new spins on a familiar genre. Which I disagree with heavily. Well, at least the jovial parts. Is the game jovial and connected in all of these parts? Well, yes. But that doesn't really match the whole horror theme of the game and the whole zombies and the gore. And it doesn't help build the atmosphere. But more on that later. GameSpot was slightly less positive, but would still rate the game positively with a 7 out of 10 score. They made a point to say that Back 4 Blood felt like a worthy successor to Left 4 Dead, and that they enjoyed the chaotic combat. They, like IGN, would also laud the card system. Overall, on aggregate review website Metacritic, Back 4 Blood would score a 77 out of 100 from 46 different critics. Though as I have always done on the series when it's present, I must acknowledge that there was a strong divide between the critics and the players regarding Back 4 Blood. Players on most websites were rating the game at around a 50% rating, which was a whole two letter grades worse than the critics. Critics are rather positive about Back 4 Blood, and nearly none of them were talking about the game's serious and apparent issues. For example, the performance in the game was very poor and would lead to a number of bugs and poor gaming experiences that have been documented in various YouTube videos. Critics also didn't acknowledge the giant elephant in the room that we hinted at with my experience in open beta. That's the lack of content in Back 4 Blood. The game felt clearly like a game as a service, and I mean that in the bad not finished but trying to sell future content sort of way. Even with the Game Pass buffer, players on Steam and other platforms were complaining about a severe lack of content in Back 4 Blood. It wasn't just because the acts were rather short and lacked replayability, which was kind of a cardinal sin for a replayable cooperative shooter. It was because TRS wouldn't be including player-made content. Yeah, that's right. All of that invoking the Left 4 Dead name and they wouldn't even be including mods which help make Left 4 Dead arguably one of the most famous games ever. Mods in Left 4 Dead are everything from balancing, to skins and overhauls. Not having mods would both cripple replayability, community support, and the game's longevity in the case of Back 4 Blood. I mention it in this segment regarding a lack of content because sometimes players and player-generated content can bridge that gap. Just ask Zenimax. Without it though, now players would be inevitably waiting for new content to come, and most likely having to pay for it. 
Back for Blood, the game as a service it was, would receive its first expansion, paid expansion I might add, April 12th, 2022. New much needed content was introduced including new ridden hives, two new cleaners, three new warped ridden, new skins, and new cards. Hives were a sort of mini-dungeon and were a fun addition to Back for Blood, but like the generic name sort of implies, the expansion wasn't really anything to write home about. Tunnels of Terror was a good update, but a paid expansion? That seemed like a bit of a stretch. Players were suggesting that it should have been a part of the base game anyway, but it was cut up to release separately and then line some pockets. Nothing new or expansion level enough was added with Tunnels of Terror which set a poor precedent going forward. To make matters worse, Turtle Rock Studios would sell an annual pass meant to account for the new DLCs at a separate price for players who didn't pre-order. The problem being is that for those that did pre-order, they're basically paying for more and got less in the end because at launch, the DLC was supposed to be available, and it wasn't. Which is already a sin in itself, right? Day 1 DLC? Ew but the annual pass was a bit of a slap in the face for those who were early adopters, and they got nothing to show for it. Total Rock Studios would follow that expansion up with another, Children of the Worm, August 30th, 2022. Children of the Worm would add a new playable act, a new cleaner to play as, a number of new items, cards, and skins. While the story content edition and new cleaner Dan were welcomed additions, they weren't very hearty meals and players were yet again complaining about the expansion being light on the bones. While the original story of the game wasn't particularly liked by the players, as the disjointed themes and characters made the story feel really out of place, a six-mission paid DLC no matter how you sliced it was a meager offering. The assumptions of content being sliced up and packaged for post-launch were seeming more and more realistic. Due to selling a DLC season pass, TRS only needed to sell one more expansion to complete their yearly content. Their willingness to continue to make content then would likely depend on their successes selling the new DLC. Now where things get a bit weird is with the final expansion. Released August 30th, 2022. Now I say weird because, well, it was actually a good expansion. And it would be received well. It would add a new 5 Mac act that would feature arguably the most diverse locale and environments yet. New cleaners that were very loved and enjoyed. New items, weapons, cards, and more skins were also added to the game. Besides another super generic, vaguely horror genre name, River of Blood was another paid expansion for players eager for new content. So even though it was positively received, it made playing Back for Blood on anything not Game Pass an expensive venture. While this makes TRS money in the short term, it's not the best strategy for attracting a long-term audience. After players would exhaust their funds to buy the first expansion, they likely wouldn't buy any more and play the game anymore. It also spurs fans of your game and your company when it seems like you're completely willing to monetize on an unfinished game on purpose. Remember, the game was delayed as well. When community morale is already low for your company due to your previous failures and abandonment with a similar approach in Evolve, well, Back for Blood's failure could spell disaster for TRS's prospects going forward, as their reputation would be heavily damaged, repeating the same thing again. There are comments on the reviews of Back for Blood that even state this obviously, saying that you shouldn't support TRS because they abandon their games. Now, whether this is because their contracts are up, and they can no longer and have to work on those games, or they're just moving on to their next projects. It wasn't a good look for the company, whatever the reasons were, especially one that repeatedly even two games later was still trying to loosely cash in on the success of a game that came out over a decade ago. Proving the dissenters and spurned Evolve fans right, development for Back for Blood would reportedly end February 2nd, 2023. Todorok Studios is actually pretty small for a studio making AAA games. We don't have enough folks to continue to work on Back for Blood content while we spin another game. Yes, another game. I found the press release to be quite shocking, as TRS seems to be literally confirming what some of the players' concerns of them were as a company. The problem is, is that they're not even seeing it as a problem. Now I get that companies, and well, all companies have to make money, and they have a limited amount of workforce, and each company has to position those to work efficiently. But TRS had now abandoned two of their multiplayer shooters with this logic, which seemed really poor form, especially for a multiplayer developer. It seemed like they basically had no accountability after just one year into their game's launch. And while there's a legion, for some reason, of fans who are defending TRS and Back for Blood, like Kotaku, ew, stating, well, it's not an MMO, it's not supposed to go on forever, but sure, it's supposed to go on long enough to reach a form of quality though, right? Well, at least most people would kind of expect that. And go long enough to stand up to the reputation that they're trying to invoke, at least in some fraction, right? 
Defending the fact that corporations design business models around games as a service and then giving up support on them after the season pass expires doesn't make you virtuous or helpful in any discussion except bootlicking. It's resulting in worse games too, and defending it is aiding in that outcome, so please stop. Especially when, as I seem to be the only person who keeps repeating this ad nauseum, the game is always online, which means it can die, dammit. Yes, we've already seen this multiple times. Multiple single-player games that we've even featured on this series that were online only died, just like Back for Blood could. So while you might be okay with the game not ever having reached its expectations, whether lofty or just the basic foundational ones, you shouldn't defend a game that maximized how much money it made and will have nothing to show for it long term when it could eventually die and become unplayable too. It's not like Turtle Rock Studios hasn't done that before too. In fact, after Back 4 Blood was announced, launched, and development was ended, it was dwarfed on Steam by Left 4 Dead. And I'm talking like 20x the population dwarfed. Now if you're wondering why, besides just being a legendary game and having quite the name recognition, in the next section I will cover in detail why Back 4 Blood wasn't Left 4 Dead, and how the comparisons ultimately proved to be toxic, and even fatal, and how a game nearly 15 years old is still kicking ass. We've avoided the comparisons as much as possible, but sorry detectives, TRS brought this upon themselves. Nobody else was screaming from the creators of Left 4 Dead and placing that pressure on them until they publicly did it themselves, when they announced the game out of the gate. So that pressure might be part of what cooked them in the end, and I'm going to break down why the comparisons were far less helpful than TRS expected. The Crobcat video I referenced shows that the 200 plus developers that worked on Left 4 Dead, between Valve and Turtle Rock Studios, only six of them would go on to work for Back 4 Blood. So this means that not only is it not the same original team, it would be hard to capture the original magic when you're lacking so many of the same key characters. The other aspect rarely acknowledged in the Back 4 Blood and Left 4 Dead discussions is the engines. Now I'm not going to sit here and say that Back 4 Blood's engine, which is the Unreal Engine 4, is not a quality engine. However, the argument that I'm going to make is that the Source engine was just better suited especially in this particular type of game, and it outperformed it. It doesn't take long to notice that either. For starters, Left 4 Dead has positional damage, ragdoll effects, accounting for very live and real feeling zombies that you can blow all over your screen to smithereens. The lip syncing as common with the Source engine is also just fantastic and helps contribute to the immersion overall. Back 4 Blood by comparison feels like it's definitely done on a high-end engine, but it lacks much of that same detail and special aspects that set Left 4 Dead and Source Engine apart. So the discussion and debate of the two games is very much one about engines, and which one performed better for the task, and in this case the Source Engine just performed better. It's not always just the engine that's the culprit though, in fact that's very rarely the case, I mean, it's just a tool, right? The other thing that feels quite apparent though when playing Back 4 Blood versus the legendary Left 4 Dead it's just a lack of soul. Soul in the context of a video game is the little things that you notice when exploring the world, like the survivor notes in Left 4 Dead and the survivor rooms. Souls are zombies having their own unique identities and outfits, like the witch in Left 4 Dead, or like the construction zombie. You get the idea. Soul in this context is going above and beyond and making the little things count. They might not individually wow anybody, but when combined together help round out a game. Back for Blood had a severe lack of soul in these sort of moments that could be felt from anything from the main story to the characters you played at to even the overall dialogue and narrative of the game. The cleaners, for example, are incredibly generic and lacking in personalities. They just feel like superheroes thrust into a zombie game and really good at killing zombies. Take Holly, for example. Let's compare her to Zoe from Left 4 Dead 2. Holly's whole gimmick is being a tough girl that has a bat and stuff. Okay, well to be fair, her bio says that her parents died and she has a never say die attitude. Wait, what? Why does she look so happy and smug for someone who's lost their parents? As somebody who lost my parents, you shouldn't look that way. Compare this to Zoe and you have a world of difference and nuance. Zoe is a true survivor, not this weird professional zombie slayer hot chick thing that TRS came up with, meaning she was thrust into the zombie situation against her will and also lost her family. The difference is, is that you can see that and hear that in Zoe and her demeanor, and know she's not just some scared heroine the majority of the time, she does plenty of zombie slaying. She undergoes this personal journey and then some, having to kill her own father to prevent him from turning. And when you encounter her in the later DLC, she's a changed character, she's much harder, much tougher, and even scarier. Cleaners on the other hand have no sort of journey, they're not relatable, they feel weird already because they're basically professional zombie killers in a survival zombie situation, which feels less survival and more like an action game. But also, why are the cleaners even doing this? 
Why are they all working together with such random backgrounds, if they're not struggling to survive in the first place? And don't get me started again on how boring and lifeless the Ridden are. They lack personality, originality, and worse, just fun in terms of mechanics. Most are just reskins of each other, which is already annoying, but where's the personality? Where's something like the smoker coughing from above as it dangles survivors to their death? Or the belly bumbling boomer? Ooh, bleh. None of that personality was to be found in Back for Blood. Everyone's personality was just a scary zombie guy. I mean, it's telling that I can actually recount each of the zombie sounds from Left 4 Dead off the top of my head. Smoker. <laughs> Hunter. <sighs> The tank. <laughs> and then there's some other DLC zombies that I kind of forgot. But you get the idea. These are iconic and memorable, and even though I haven't played Left 4 Dead in years at this point, I still remember them. I played Back for Blood this year and I don't even remember the zombies. I know that most of them seem like basically poor copycats of Left 4 Dead zombies. And that's just a shame. The cleaners feeling out of place in Back for Blood, though, leads into my final point about the comparison between the two games. Probably the most damning one, too. In Left 4 Dead, you play as a survivor. You're trying to survive by making it from checkpoint to checkpoint. That's not just felt in the characters you play as, it's seen in the world that you discover and felt in the design of the game itself. Left 4 Dead is a cinematic horror experience that developers wanted the game to feel like playing a horror movie. It being divided into different campaigns and how the campaigns are even showcased really feels that way too. Sure, there's plenty of zombie killing in action in Left 4 Dead, but it feels more like a consequence of you trying to survive as a survivor versus you just being some zombie killing maniac. When playing through Back for Blood, it very clearly feels like a game that wants to look and feel cool and scary by fans, but it doesn't feel scary when you play the game. Because the game doesn't even treat itself like a horror game, it's just an action shooter with zombies in it. And the ridden encounters feel more like a nuisance than a cinematic experience like the Infected did in Left 4 Dead. That's because they're just obstacles in your way. Unless of something that serves as a serious threat, you must survive even thematically. In Back for Blood, you're playing as the winners, basically. <laughs> and the game feels far more tame because of that. Writing and the story issues aside, Back for Blood struggles to escape the shadow of its far more cinematic and epic older brother, Left 4 Dead. For me, Back for Blood feels like a shooter with zombies and not a zombie shooter. The detective music is playing, which means it's time to gather up all of the clues and put this case to bed. What went wrong with Back for Blood? Well, it was over-monetized and understuffed. No mod support. Poor performance and bugs. It launched incomplete and then they charged for the rest of the content. It just had a lack of soul. It must be played with friends online. It had a lackluster PvP mode in Ridden. I really wanted Back for Blood to be a good game. And I really felt like with Evolve, Trotorock Studios at the very least showed that they had the potential, again, to make a fun multiplayer shooter experience. In the end, we got a half-baked first-person zombie shooter that relied on prior name recognition and failed to eclipse that same name, in expectation, or even get close. Back for Blood won't just have potentially the legacy of being the sort of forgotten Left 4 Dead spiritual successor, it could even die, have the server shut down, and never be playable again. Which doesn't sound like something you should ever be saying with a cooperative zombie shooter. But TRS is already fast and hard at work on their next title, with next to no details released concerning such. While I was inclined to give them another chance after the faltering of Evolve, coming off yet another failure in Back for Blood at an even larger scale, I don't know how excited I am for their next title. Making fun flawed games isn't a crime, nor even a reprehensible thing. But abandoning your multiplayer games merely years after launch doesn't buy future faith in your products. Just saying. Thanks for watching. My friend, the time has come to put an end to this meaningless conflict.